Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Remy Myers, and I have with me here Hussein Nasser. And together, we'll discuss network management with ArcGIS, an introduction to the utility network. So let's get started. Looking at the session, we'll cover the system architecture and new licensing model, network and attribute rules, pop-ups, and network management using Arcade. And finally, tracing and other upcoming features. So looking at the architecture and the utility network, the first place to start is really the business drivers of a utility. Safety, reliability, customer service, asset management, and innovation are all founding elements of a utility. The utility network was conceived to address the changing environment that regulatory agencies have put on utilities to give a better information platform to support the system of engagement, the system of record, and the system of insight. So exploring the utility network, the first level that we start in are the operational domains. So this is where you model your electric, your telco, your gas, your water, and each domain has different properties and different elements to support the data model. In addition to an operational domain, we also have a structural domain. So every utility network has at least two domains. And inside the structural domain, we primarily have junctions, lines, and boundaries. And junctions can be things like poles or manholes. Lines can be ducts, trenches, and boundaries can be things like a pump house or a facility. So these elements may not have connectivity, but are still associated with reliability in the network and are important to maintain and track. So let's go back and look at the operational network again. So the business is expressed as tiers. So electric has generation, transmission, and distribution, all with separate schemas and rule bases. Telco may have networks dedicated to wireless or fiber or cable. Gas may have gathering zones, or pressure zones, or isolation zones, or even cathodic protection zones each with different rules, each can be interconnected. And water has storage areas, district networks, and service territories. So Hussein, can you take us through the first demo and walk us through the utility network? Thank you so much, Rami. So let's just jump ahead and talk about the utility network and the architecture and the information models. So there's there's so much demos uh, we're gonna show today. And uh, essentially, the utility network has been uh, has been following a model where things are the classes are grouped together into essentially a, a denormalized manner where previously in the geometric network you would have a bunch of classes and you create a network out of them we have realized that there are some limitations to that model and we decided to move things to a, a, a smaller set of a denormalized uh, set of classes and these are classes are the electric distribution uh, the, these classes are the assembly the device junction line and subnet line so essentially five classes and these classes think of them are grouped into these logical grouping of what we call the domain network so the domain network think of them as a 
as the logical grouping of the, your utility. So you can have, your heavy utilities can have multiple domain networks. Uh, a one domain network here that I have is called the electric distribution. And you can add another network called the water distribution. And you can do very interesting analytics because of that. So you, you can, you can uh, perform traces and analytics between your two utilities uh, together. That now that you have everything in one place. So that's one option. And when you create a utility network, it actually comes uh, comes out with a, uh, an out-of-the-box domain network called the structure network. And the structure network, think of them as uh, things that support your architecture. Poles, towers, ducts, right? Things like that. And uh, we use this as its own domain network as well. And you can start adding uh, more and more uh, assets to this. So if we're taking away the ability for you to add your own classes, how do you, how do you actually add more assets or types, right? So we have introduced the ability to actually add uh, subtypes, right? But you always had that, but the ability to add subtypes now comes with another uh, kind of set of layers that you can add uh, to to define your uh, your infrastructure. So, for example, here I have an arrestor, and this is a subtype. And I have in the device class itself, I have an arrestor, I have a capacitor, a circuit breaker, a fuse, a generator, and and so on, right? And since it is not really enough just to have a subtype, we have added another discriminator that we call the asset type. And then we just renamed the subtype to be called asset group just for consistency. So the asset group is the subtype and the asset type is another discriminator that further divide your assets. So for example, I have a low voltage arrestor here and a medium voltage arrestor and a medium voltage station arrestor. And you, and you can think about that. Once you have this layer of separations, now you can do very interesting thing. You can assign certain properties to these uh, uh, to to these actually to, to the subtype levels. For example, I have here an assembly, and some assemblies can actually be containers like a transformer bank or an arrestor bank. They can be containers for other devices, right? In this case, arrestor bank uh, can actually be container for arrestors and so on. All right. So let's talk about a, a little bit about the network topology. So for the network topology. We have decided that when you create your features and your data and you start pouring in features and data and lines and, and points and all these devices and junctions that we talked about, running analytics on those features can be very interesting because uh, how do you do that, right? We cannot play with that in the geometry space. We cannot do that in the... In the in the feature space. So what we have decided to do is we have built an analogous network space, right? So there's the feature space where you create features, as you can see, this is a bunch of features and layers. And there is another space that is kind of invisible to the users called the network space, where we, when, when you create feature and you decided to validate or build the topology, we will build this features into a very fast, efficient, highly accessible and uh, 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 scalable uh, network index. And we use that to perform the analytics. So that's essentially the network index and the feature space. So when you add a feature, what we do essentially is we create a dirty area and notifying the space that, hey, by the way, something has changed. Go ahead and validate so you can actually uh, link it to the, uh, to the network space and sync it up. Uh, back to you, Remy. Thanks, Hussein. So let's take a little bit closer look at the feature layers that Hussein was using as he walked through his demonstration of the architecture. So in the operational domain, the feature layers all have connectivity, right? And they all have very specific properties. So the devices represent operational features that can be open or closed, that can uh, regulate flow or transmit flow or can receive flow like meters. So they can be things like meters and switches and valves and transformers and pumps. 
So they're all action oriented. They're, they're operational devices. Um, junctions, on the other hand, have no operational capability. They serve to connect linear assets. So you can't turn a junction on and off. Uh, it can't change the properties of flow. So typically when you see junctions, there'll be things like connection points, such as taps or T's on a pipe. Assemblies are also point features, but they represent a collection or a container, if you will, of devices and junctions, such as switch gears or, or transformer banks or, or pump banks or valve bank or valve assemblies. So all these things can contain individual devices and junctions. And we'll get into containment shortly, but it's really interesting. So, so these assemblies represent a specific operational function at a location but are comprised of junction and devices. And then the lines represent your linear assets, your wires, your cables, your pipes. They contain the commodity that flows. And your subnetworks are really interesting because they're a logical representation of all the elements of the feeder or the circuit. So this is where all the properties get aggregated up to you and give you information about all the elements of your circuit or feeder. So unlike your devices or junctions or assemblies or lines, subnetworks are only configurable in that you can define what network attributes can be propagated up to it, but you can't set the distinctive characteristics of a subnetwork the way you can devices or lines. So we have two elements to help us define these devices and junctions and assemblies and lines. And the general element is called an asset group. So this asset group provides a general description of the device, such as switches or valves or transformer pumps or junctions such as connection points, assemblies and lines. And if we've got a general description, then we need a specific description. And for that, we use something called an asset type. So the asset type enables you to define with higher granularity the properties of the devices, the junctions, the assemblies or the lines. So, Let's go ahead and pass it back on to Hussein one more time. And he's gonna talk about um, this concept called contingent attribute values. Thanks, Rami. Uh, so let's jump into contingent attribute values and uh, discuss a little bit more about this technology. So we're gonna talk about the data quality uh, aspects of contingent attribute values. Why did we invent this uh, uh, feature? And uh, there is a reason, and that's data, data quality. And it's mainly it's a requirement that comes from utilities. And we're gonna explain that actually. And uh, we're gonna explain contingent attribute values. And then finally, we're gonna, I, I'm, I'm gonna show you guys a demo of uh, using utilities, like essentially electric utilities. All right, so. Data quality, there are two aspects of data quality in the geodatabase. So you can either protect and ensure your data quality by uh, preventing bad data, that's at the data entry level, or by actually reviewing existing data that might have been uh, bad, right? And uh, or doesn't really satisfy the set of rules that your organization have. Okay, so that's essentially the ensuring data quality aspect of it. Example, domains, subtypes, and default values that exist today already does that, right, for you. 
attribute rules do, do that uh, the same thing as well it prevents you from making bad data into make uh, from entering your system to begin with and there are this is a geo database specific Attrib uh, attribute rules also geo database specific that also prevents you from even having that data to go into your system to begin with domains you know that you know how domains work guys it's a list of coded value domains or range values that users have to be to, to select one of these values if it doesn't allow you to select more more than that right and then just the fact of having these uh, specific values uh, kind of minimizes the errors that the users have subtypes is the same thing yeah for this given subtype these are the applicable domains or these applicable def default values right so instead of creating features with nulls you want to specify certain default values so minimize the bad data as much as possible data view is the otherwise where hey i have data let me review it okay and we we, we can talk about that at, uh, in another presentation and the geodatabase functionality that we added for this is contingent attribute values and attribute rules. For contingent attribute values, we have, it was being introduced in 2.3, and it's a built-in geodatabase functionality, and it prevents you from making bad data at the uh, at the data entry level, right? Whether it's Pro or any other clients, if those clients support it, okay? And the concept is the idea of a field group. So you create, you create essentially a field group, and all these groups will be contingent on each other. Let me explain. So let's assume we have an address point feature class here, and there are uh, four fields, uh, the state, the county, and city, and zip code. You want that if a user picks uh, the state, there are certain states, obviously, that you have, and I only included two states here, but you get the idea. You can add all of the states. But if I pick, for example, California, for the counties, I only want to see counties that are in California. And this is also a contingent attribute value, right? Because the counties, the, the domain that is county, have every single county that exists in uh, any in the united states right but having this value actually be contingent on the state now you can actually filter down the certain counties that are only in california not only that if you pick a county san bernardino for example you can only pick the cities that are in san, uh, 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 the san bernardino county and you can you get the idea it's it's way simpler uh, less uh, less values to deal with so we're going to make less errors if we populate that stuff okay and similar thing with the zip code once i pick cities i only get to give you zip codes for redlands you get the idea how about a demo guys Guys, let's jump in and talk about the contingent attribute values. And this is um, this is a very interesting feature that we have added back, as uh, Remy said, uh, back in Pro 2.3 and ArcGIS 10.7. And uh, when we decide, when we thought about domains in general, domains or coded value domains are a set of properties that you can add and you give the users essentially options. So let's talk about just domains, showing you how domains look like. We, we're very familiar about domains, right? For example, a device status is a coded value domain here, is a field that is assigned a domain, and these are the applicable coded value domains with for this particular field. But you guys asked us, we want these certain domains to be contingent on each other and the utilities market actually uh, drive that requirement so for example low voltage assets have a certain values that are applicable for voltages right like uh, if i am working with a low voltage line or a service point the voltage can only be so much right versus compared to a medium voltage or a high voltage the voltage actually differs right so how do we use the same concept of domains but make them contingent on the actual subtype or the asset type so here's what we did so for a medium voltage line you would see that we have a, a domain assigned to this 
It's called the nominal voltage. And see the values for this. It's a certain values, 12K, 12.5, uh, 13, and so on, right? And there's an option to show all. However, if I select the low voltage line, you would see that the nominal voltage is actually very few, right? Compared, it's just 120 volt, 240 and 600 volt and so on, right? So that's a, what we call the contingent attribute value. So this will help editors uh, kind of minimize the number of errors instead of scrolling through a large set of domains, right? Just to pick something, you only have what is applicable based on the asset group or the subtype. And uh, let's actually show how well, you can configure these, uh, uh, these uh, contingent values. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to the medium voltage and click on the tab that is called contingent values. And if I select the low voltage, you can see that the nominal voltage that are applicable to me are these values only. And I can go ahead and decide to add more if I wanted to. However, the medium voltage, on the other hand, these are the applicable values, right? And uh, you can add more and you can remove more. And uh, that's essentially where uh, the contingent value is actually powered, right? And contingent values also are available in Pro. And uh, in 2.3, if you create a GeoDatabase with 2.3, you'll be able to create those contingent values. You can publish into a 10.7 server or later and cons consume those two. And you can also consume the at contingent attribute values from the REST endpoint. Let's actually show that. So I'm here on my server manager and I'm going to click on my Naperville Electric Postgres service. And if I click capabilities and under feature service, I open the feature service, you will see if you scroll all the way down, you'll see a new method that is called query contingent values. And for if you're building a client that you want to consume these contingent values, you can actually do that today. So the query contingent values takes a layer and you can know the layer name by actually specifying that or you can just pass in an empty array and we're gonna query everything for you. This obviously returns a protocol buffer, but I'm not really interested in protocol buffer because I can't really see it. Uh, protocol buffers are uh, essentially the, 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 the binary format that was invented by Google around 10 years ago. And we started uh, implementing that because it, it is a schema based, it is binary and, and, and uh, it works very well across the web and services because you minimize the number of uh, round trips and uh, your payload becomes re really small. So you want that. So you'll start seeing the protocol buffer format uh, uh, show up in all of our services uh, from time to time yeah? because it's, it's, it's a very powerful. Problem with it, you cannot see it <laughs> as a human. You cannot actually read it. But you still have the option to query JSON. That's what I'm going to do right now. Obviously, I'm, I'm not getting anything else here because I need to actually specify the layer. So I'm gonna go ahead and specify the layer uh, 105, which is the line layer. Let's go ahead and do that. If I do 115, and I do a query, you can see that now I am getting the uh, attribute, contingent attribute values. And this is what we have, the contingent attribute values. We have layer 115, and these are the four field groups. We have the nominal voltage field, because that's what the, the domain we're working on, and it's contingencies. These are the contingencies on that stuff. Right, and all the possible values and conting contingencies on this, right? And you can see that this is this is essentially what we have today. So for subtype three, this is the value, subtype four, this is the value, subtype five, this is the value, and so on, right? All the possible values will be essentially uh, displayed here and they are filtered and you can build an experience today this this uh, technology is being brought up to collector and all, all of that stuff as of today is still in pro only but this is there's nothing stopping you from building a client a web client that actually consumes their contingent attribute value uh, back to you Rami. thank you Hussein so let's go ahead and take a look 
at the licensing model for the utility network. So traditionally, prior to the release of 10.8, the utility network license sat on the server. So what that meant is that anyone who had access to the server had full functionality access to the utility network. And to run the utility network prior to the release of ArcGIS Enterprise 10.8, you needed a user type license or a user type and that user type enabled you to access the REST services. You needed an enterprise license for the ArcGIS server and portal, and you needed the ArcGIS utility network server extension. Now, with the release of 10.8, that license moves from the server to the user type. So we no longer need a utility network server extension. Now, to access the utility network, you need a user type with the extension on the user type. And you still need an enterprise license to run the services and publish the services. So let's look at what happens if you don't have a utility network extension. So you have to have a user type to be able to hit the REST services in a multi-user environment. And with no user type extension, you could still view, query, or select network features. You could view associations in the association window to include connectivity, containment, and structure associations in the attribute window. Now, in Runtime 100.7, associations cannot be viewed without the extension, but that'll be changing in the near future. Now, let's, let's see what happens when you do have the license extension. So for viewers, they can now perform traces, display stored network diagrams, and see graphic representations of associations on your map. Remember, without the utility network extension, all you could see is the associations in the attribute pane. For an editor and a field worker, they can not only edit utility network features, but they can also manage those associations and they can update subnetworks. And if you have a creator or a GIS professional, standard or advanced, you can do anything. You can administer and publish the network. Now, you notice under the GIS professional, at the basic level, the utility network license is an add-on. So that means that your organization can provision a license, a utility network extension to uh, ArcGIS Professional Basic. But let's take a look at how everyone can get the utility network. So for every four core utility network management server extension that you had prior to the release of ArcGIS Enterprise 10.8, you will receive 50 utility network type extensions provisioned to your organization. For every ArcGIS desktop license, it includes one utility network user type extension. Once again, also provisioned to your organization. So your organization can assign it to you or can assign it to someone else. It just gets put in that organizational account. But if you purchase a professional user type, standard or advanced, the ArcGIS Utility Network extension is baked into that license. So you can't reprovision it to someone else, but it exists inside the characteristics of that license. 
And then the other option or the other way to get the utility network license extension is to purchase it through your sales rep. So Hussein, can you show us uh, how this works in the uh, in the uh, organizational administrator portal? Thanks, Remy. As uh, as has as Remy has discussed. Uh, we have now a new licensing model where it's actually a utility network to be specific. It's a, an extension. And when you have a user, let's say I have a user called, here called John Smith in my enterprise, and his user type is a creator. And when you do that, by default, if you go to the add-ons, you will notice that the user type extension for utility network is not assigned. You have the choice if you want to, to assign the utility network service or the extension to the, to the, to the user, right? And uh, if I go ahead, I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And uh, this is this is true for almost all users types except for the GIS professional. For, so the GIS professional user type actually comes with the utility network extension so if you do that in this case and you go here you have you'll notice that this user actually by default will be assigned the utility network service and will be assigned also the parcel fabric service in this case so gis advance if you have a user of gis advance they will automatically get the user extension. And that means they can access the utility network in certain ways that Remy have talked about, right? So they, they can essentially uh, perform traces, uh, view associations, even edit the network, uh, perform sub-network management, and everything, pretty much everything in the utility network. Without that, you still can open the network, you can view it, yeah, you can read it. And uh, in the future, we will also uh, uh, relax certain uh, properties for the utility network uh, users without the utility network extension, such as viewing associations and, and properties. Uh, as for 10.8 and 2.5, you cannot view the utility network properties if uh, you don't have the extension. We're relaxing that a little bit and other stuff as well. All right, back to you, Remy. Thanks, Hussein. So next, let's go ahead and take a look at network and attribute rules. And Hussein will show us how to leverage attribute rules to build uh, more informational pop-ups and, and improve your network management using the Arcade data manipulation language. So first type of network rule we'll explore is connectivity. And inside connectivity, the first element that we have to establish as a rule is how things that are linear, such as wires and pipes, connect to objects or points, such as a operational device or a junction. So this relationship between the lines and the points all have to be established with rules, whether they're wires or pipes. And then, one of the opportunities of the utility network is that features can be separated in space but still have connectivity. The way we do that is with point-to-point -point rule types or junction-to-junction -junction rule types. So here in this example, I've got a medium voltage line on the high side coming into a fuse. And the transformer is spatially separate, but we can leverage the connective association to um, energize our system from the fuse to the transformer to the breaker and down to the low voltage line. So that's a point-to-point -point rule type. The third type of rule is an edge-to-junction-to-edge -edge rule type. So this is where you've got linear assets on both sides that have different properties and you need a operational device or a uh, operational junction to connect those two things together. So one example could be a uh, wire that's above ground needs a riser to connect um, to cable below ground. Or maybe your pipes that are on your distribution line need a special fitting to connect to the service line. So that's how our three connective rules 
The next rule type we'll look at is a containment rule. So a containment rule enables us to have a simple feature when you're zoomed out on your map, but you can dive into uh, what we call containment and see all the individual elements of uh, things like a pumping station here. So I've got the meters on the uh, distribution pipe side, um, what service pumps going to filters and then down to the individual service pipelines. Uh, you also notice that we're using um, line to point rules to connect the pipes to the respective meters and filters and we're using point to point rules to connect the meters to the pumps to the filters. And then finally our last network rule type is a structural association. So this enables us to connect our pipes to manholes, or in this case, our wire through an attachment point to a pole. So our structural elements can participate in a subnetwork. So Hussein, if you don't mind, could you show us how this looks? All right, let's quickly talk about association, network rules, and attribute rules. All right, so for association, it's a new feature that is uh, available in the utility network that didn't uh, wasn't available in the geometric network, to be honest. And we use the association to create uh, semantics such as containment, structures, and connectivity association. And you guys asked us before, uh, how can we connect two points together without a line between them? And we have we ask this question all the time. Uh, so we decided to create this semantic and, and this logical connectivity uh, that we call association. And you can see there are a bunch of association right here that is not visible. But you can easily show this content, right? and show the association by clicking this button. And you can see that this, this is actually a complete graph and these are actually connected. So this is essentially a switch gear with a bunch of switches between them. And we'll go back to that on the tracing demo and show actually how we can open and close devices and do tracing and all that stuff, right? So uh, we have essentially the switch gear containing all these devices that's the one relationship and there is attachment there is connectivity between them right these two are connected to each other these two are connected to each other so and instead of uh, you don't have you want to draw lines between things that you know that are connected you don't have to you can use association and they are very performant and fast because we bake them into the network topology that we talked about and when you went on traces they we will use the index to actually pull Pull this association from the index all right and uh, all right so let's uh, how about we actually show the network rules all right the utility network is rule based that what does that mean that means every asset type as a group must uh, be connected to a, a um, if you want to connect a certain asset group asset type to another asset group asset type you have to have a rule between them an example, right? So if I am going to go and uh, try to create a medium voltage uh, three phase overhead, right? And I am going to use, uh, let's put in some nominal voltage here, and then I'm gonna create one feature here. And then I'm gonna turn around and create another line just right beside it. This is absolutely fine because these two features are exactly the same asset group and asset type. When I validate, this graph will be built and, and uh, the network topology will say that is actually okay. You can do that. However, if I change, this is overhead, and I change it to underground three phase, obviously this is bad, right? Doesn't exist. You cannot connect an underground to overhead, right, directly. So we're getting an error now, right, as you can see. And this error is very valid. That it tells us that we have essentially, uh, we, we, have, uh, we don't have a rule to connect these two. But we do have a rule that says, hey, uh, you can connect an overhead to, uh, to an underground as long as there is a riser between them. So I'm gonna snap and I create a riser between the two. And you notice that these things are snapping because the snapping 
uh, or the editor experience is actually following my network rules, right? Which is awesome. So if I validate now, you can see that all the errors will go away. And this is essentially just a basic taste of the network uh, topology rules. How about we finalize it with the attribute rules? So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go to uh, some certain area where there are services and customers, right? And this looks like a good area, right? And I have written an attribute rule that says, if the customer service load has changed, I want you to create a log of it, right? So I'm gonna change the load of this from 600 to 700. I'm gonna just apply that edit, right? And I'm gonna change it again to 900. Like let's say it peaked. I don't know that everyone is at home right now and everybody is like starting everything and they're consuming a lot of power, right? But at some point it also changed back to 400, right? All the way down. And every edit that I made actually was an attribute rule that triggered and inserted a log to a table called a log, um, load history. So if I open this table, you can see all my changes that I have made, uh, plus other uh, other changes that I have made from other edit sessions, right? So what I have written here is an attribute rule. I'm gonna show it to you here. This is the attribute rule. It says if the service load has actually changed, and this is a new Arcade Global that we have added in, um, in 2.5 and 10.8, uh, if that changed, then go ahead and actually insert a new row in the load history table, insert that means adds, right? And uh, this is the information. I want you to populate the service load and I want you to also save the global ID of the service point that I have touched, right? So you'll keep you'll keep just adding, adding a load history of every single update. And you can, you don't have to actually edit it from pro. You, any edit from collector, from the web, will actually trigger that because our attribute rules are in the Jira database and they will essentially trigger. And what I have done is I have also added some attribute, uh, not attribute, pop up expressions that will tell me when I click, it tells me the maximum load that I have changed. Remember, I changed to 900, the minimum load, or 400, and also the average, 666, very appropriate. <laughs> Okay, so uh, yeah, and that's uh, that's what I wanted to show essentially the content, uh, the the attribute rules, the network rules, and the association. Back to you, Remy. Thank you so much, Hussein. So now that we've covered the rules, let's see how the rules work in action. And to do that, we will leverage tracing in the network. So tracing is not just about um, the operational uh, behavior of your network features. It's actually the total configuration of your network management. So what we'll do is we'll cover uh, some basic elements of tracing and sub-network management. Uh, we'll extend that tracing to the web in the runtime. And uh, let's look at how we can optimize our network management. So looking at subnetwork, you basically have two configurations. You can have a radial network configuration where you've got a primary source and your commodity is flowing down to the customer. And it's basically a single line direction to each customer. Now in a mesh configuration, you can have multiple sources and you could have loops with indeterminate flow. Now, in addition to the configuration, you also have the ability to, to determine the directionality of your network. So do you put your controllers on the source, uh, such as uh, power lines, where you've got a transformer flowing power down to the customer, or do you put it on the sink, such as a wastewater configuration, where your customers are actually the high side of the network and your commodity flows down to the facility? So having those configuration options gives you the ability 
to utilize a number of traces right out the box. So having our network controllers, we can now establish upstream or downstream traces, or we could trace the entire subnetwork or use barriers to build conditional traces. So saying, um, one more time, can you take us through and show us how this looks? Thank you so much, Remy. So yeah, let's dive in into the tracing and subnetwork management, and we're gonna also show you the tracing from the web. All right, so what you are seeing right now, guys, is actually just two features. And if I click on this, this is the first feature, and that other one is another feature. And these are called subnet lines, and they represent the circuits, but beneath that, there are a uh, thousands of thousands of features. This is just a summary of what we call the subnetwork. And a subnetwork is an aggregate of all the features that uh, has a starting point and it has a stopping point, right? Start, starting point is where we call it the controller or your circuit source, most of the time the electric and, and your, your zones, right? And it just stops when it finds like uh, a terminating condition, such as stop when you find an open device or in case of water stop when you find a closed valve right so you can define these conditions so let's go ahead and uh, show you some traces here if i placed a starting point right here on this line and i uh, performed a downstream trace you will notice that the trace will stop in a certain area and we're going to show that area right now All right, so uh, I'm gonna select the domain network. I'm gonna select the tier where I save all my configuration, basically where things, uh, where does it start and where does it stop, all these things that we talked about. And if I run a trace, you will notice that the trace will start from here and it will go all the way down here and it will stop. Have you noticed? It stopped right on this point. And if we investigate that particular point that actually stopped the trace, we will notice that uh, the device status is actually open. And that means that I have configured my traversability in the trace to stop when it finds an open device. It's very clear definitions, right? Since I'm in a version, I am going to actually change. I make a change and I'm, I'll open this device instead, okay? And if I open a device, basically a dirty area will be created. That means I need to validate so I can update my network index. So now my network index has the latest and greatest changes, right? Otherwise, my network index will not know that I actually opened the device because these are network attributes. So I'm going to go ahead and just execute the trace again. And if you notice that this time the trace actually stopped farther, right it stops right here and it also selected the container because i told it to right so if i made this change and i can run a trace i can actually respect these changes so i'll go ahead and save my edit because i want to do something interesting now if i saved my edit now technically i isolated an entire neighborhood right so i need to actually refeed it by another network. So since this is open, if you remember, I'm going now to actually close it, to feed it from the other circuit. So if I validate this now, and then I'm gonna go ahead and save my edit, and I'm gonna run a special uh, tool that is called update subnetwork. And update subnetwork will update these circuits to reflect the latest reality. So circuit number three was just this guy. Before we update them, let's go ahead and pop them up and actually see the number of customers on them. 494, or almost 500 customers on the red circuit and on the yellow circuit, it's around 1,700, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and update subnetwork three, which is the red one. And what will will happen is we'll, the trace will run again and will recreate that subnet line, the single line feature. And as you notice, that whole red part has gone away. But this is not enough because we need to update the actual, uh, the, the second subnetwork so we get the full picture. So I'm gonna go ahead and update that subnetwork. And you can see that 
it's gonna take slightly longer because it's doing more work and you can see that the yellow circuit has taken over the new part and if i go to subnetwork uh, 3 it doesn't have 500 should have much less only 70 as you noticed all right and subnetwork uh number one essentially have should have more obviously this is not a proper load balancing but it's just to, to demonstrate the idea so how about we finally show you how to actually uh run uh, the same traces different traces on water because we didn't talk about water let's show some love for water so i'm gonna show an isolation trace on a water network and what you're seeing here is a web trace that i've been uh, hosted on uh, on aws and uh, essentially we're hosting the network the water network uh, in a utility network and a different utility network and i am going to execute an isolation trace one of the traces that we have in the utility network what what we will do essentially it will simulate a leak in one of these pipes right and if i click here i want to simulate a leak and what this trace does it, it tells me what are the valves that you need to close so you can contain that leak and, and, and close, probably remove all the, uh, stop the leak, right? And it will also notify all the customer, it will tell you all the customers that are affected as a result. How about we run it? If I run an isolation trace, it will contact the rest endpoint. In this case, it's sending a clear rest endpoint. And you can see that the red dots here, if I zoom in, the red dots are the valves that are closed that need to be closed and the yellow is essentially the customers that need to be notified we found 52 affected customer and we had to close two isolating traces uh, two isolating valves but and you can start experimenting with this now so okay this is a little bit more expensive how about we if we if we move the if we tried these valves instead of these right and you can experiment with these as much as you want and uh, that's it for me back to you remy so let's wrap it up with an overview of upcoming training. So if you're looking for the roadmap for the utility network, uh, I actually presented that with the um, advanced utility network session. Uh, so I'd recommend uh, you go ahead and look that up and uh, take a listen, uh, Eric and uh, Dave Crawford and uh, at the end of that session, we'll cover the roadmap. But, you know, from a training, meeting, and conference perspective, uh, the next thing we have coming up is in just a few days, Hussein and I will be back in the studio for the live training seminar on March 26th. We're really looking forward to that. And uh, we hope to uh, show you some of the new functionality that's changed since the initial release of the Utility Network and give Hussein the opportunity to show some more demos and dive a little bit deeper into arcade technology. Uh, two ongoing, well, uh, <laughs> two Esri Academy opportunities you have are the uh, creating and managing utility networks with ArcGIS, and that's available right now. Uh, we've got another course that's coming up this summer that is, um, for advanced users, and that is designing con and configuring utility networks with ArcGIS. And this will take you through, uh, you know, instead of a user experience, it'd be more like of an administrator experience or a configuration experience of the utility network. Uh, right now, we still have on the uh, schedule, but it's subject to change. Uh, European Geoconnex from May 12th through 14th. Uh, we look forward to seeing everyone again at the Esri User Conference July 13th through 17th, where we will have a lot of presentations and material covering the utility network, and Geoconnex on October 26th through 29th. Now, I just mentioned uh, Eric and Dave's Advanced Utility Network session. I would also encourage you to reach out and look up the uh, Utility Network Runtime SDK session with uh, Rich Rue and David Crawford. Um, those guys have a lot of good information. So we really appreciated your time. 
Uh, we always enjoy presenting this material, and we hope you have a good day. Take care out there.